Hey, Gwilym, it, feel, it feels like it's been a little while since we've done a podcast, but um, of course, people would have been listening to us because we recorded a load of Earthshot podcasts back to back, didn't we? So, um, so we've still been out there releasing, but it's been a few weeks since we've had a chance to have a chat. How are you? Yes, yeah, I'm good. Well, we caught up. We did, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we caught up in person, didn't we? We actually met in in the physical world. You would, you said you were too old to have a pint, and then we had a pint, and then I had a pint. Yeah, I um, yeah, I was recovering from norovirus, and I thought that I probably shouldn't um, risk alcohol, uh, and then that lasted as long as long as the walk to the pub. Well, it's your idea as well, because I was being really respectful and saying, Lee, I get it. Man's health comes first. Absolutely, well done. Are you, are you trying to make me feel really guilty? Is this kind of like a let, let's put Lee on a guilt trip thing? Who? You. When? Oh, that about that? No, no, it's just I can't keep up with you. You're so whimsical. <laughs> like a little music box. Is that whimsical? <laughs> <laughs> what, you and the tutu going round and round and round really slowly? If, Lee, early question. I normally have these till the end, but if you were a ballerina in the music box, what would the music be that you slowly twirled to? Oh, uh, Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet, probably. Oh, that's perfect, obviously. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I know. I know it's been polluted by The Apprentice, but um, but it's yeah, it's, it's still a tune that lives in my head. I think I'd go for a kind of a music box, that kind of tinkly, tinkly. It's a little strips of metal, isn't it? Tinkly, tinkly version of it. I like to move it, move it. <laughs> wasn't exactly where my mind was going when you when you said ballerina, but um, I, I had no idea this was going to be the friendly bants this morning. It's, no, um, no, I thought we were going to talk about the storm, but there we go. Yeah, it was a cracker of a storm. I do love a storm. You would yeah, say why? Do love a storm. Why do you love a storm? I, why? I, don't know. Why? I was going to say the smell, but of course I've, I've, I have no sense of smell these days, so I can't smell a storm anymore. And storms don't smell. Two reasons. Well, they do. They do. After a really warm spell, smell, storms smell lovely. You've got that kind of like freshness, that warm earth and kind of damp air and all of those kind. I can you've tell never you lived, man. You've never lived. I've never lived in the country. In the city, it smells like wet dog. <laughs> Uh, is that a good note to move on and introduce the guests? <laughs> or we could talk about something else silly. Lee Davis and Willem Roberts are the two IPs in a pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property, brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. So we, we, we have a, a habitual returner today. We, we have our occasional guests that we like to get back, don't we? So, um, Gitano, can you kind of reintroduce yourself for the audience? Oh, yes, of course, and, and thank you for having me back. I, I'm Gaetano Dimita. I, I play video games, and in my free time, I teach interactive entertainment law at the <laughs> Mary University of London. So you just play video games. That's that's your gig. <laughs> yes, I wish it was. But uh, it's aspirational, you know. I'm at a <laughs> stage in my life in which I know what I want to do when I grow up, but I'm still not there. <laughs> that's a great it's a great place to be and Michaela welcome to the podcast for the first time uh, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us what games you play when when you play um Gitano online <laughs> <laughs> thanks thanks for inviting me as well um I'm Michaela McDonald I'm Gaetano's friend and colleague from Queen Mary University of London uh I watch my kids play video games um and when they do that it's uh at the moment mainly Roblox and the other one is coding on uh discord a lot um so i don't what? know that probably doesn't qualify as playing uh as playing video games well obviously watching at least three other things at the same time simultaneously that's a must these days my, my, my children are that old um i've got six children the, the age range is a 15 up to like 33 i think one of their first video game exposures was hogs of war if any of you remember that no obviously not no, I'm nodding in a podcast, so. <laughs> that, that was my best attempt at being relevant, Will. Of course, you can drive from here on in. You know what you're talking about. Well, I think, I think we got nostalgic last time about video games, actually. Did, I'm, I'm, an 80s, I'm an 80s gamer, um, where it's mostly arcade-based, which I love. I love everything about a video game arcade. And my favourite game remains, the I think I said, the Vector Graphics original Star Wars game that came out in about, I'm going to say, 82, 83 spectacular I mean, you said they sat in the booth and then you had Obi-Wan Kenobi telling you what to do it was I was terrible at it absolutely terrible but I had a friend who could go around the clock he could actually keep playing there was a bug which meant if you got a million it just reset and he kept playing fantastic um I have nothing I was actually going to ask um Michaela what's your kind of what's your research area where do you where do you focus I think I got into 
sort of interactive entertainment law field uh, when I started looking at virtual property. I don't know if anybody remembers the uh, seminal case um, from China early 2000s uh, where one gamer killed another over a stolen sword. Uh, and I think that kind of that now, moment. Can I, can I just check? Can I just say that was physically yeah. killed, not killed in yes. the virtual way? Okay. Yes, I should have. Uh, I should have specified that in the real world, they um, uh, there was physical impact of uh, of this theft wow. of of a sword. And I think in that moment, uh, it sort of exploded into the public um, public discourse and uh, public consciousness, like wow, there are some valuable, potentially valuable items uh, in the digital environment and people do care about them and they feel there is a complete lack of um, legal remedy available to them should something go wrong. Um, uh, so I started looking into, into this particular um, aspect of, of video games and um, digital assets and that was 15 years ago. And it sort of snowballed into uh, joining Gaetano and building the interactive entertainment law scholarship and uh, taking it taking it further from there. Uh, it's curious that you use uh, the, you know in the real world when probably most of the conversation today is going to be based on the fact that these two things you know online and offline are kind of merging and overlapping. And it's going to be an headache uh, for, for, for IP. I mean, I, I'll be fine. I mean, me and Michele, we're researchers, so we're just going to create problems and highlight what the problems are. But you that you have to deal with in, in practice, that's going to be the nightmare sh scenarios. The, theoretically, there's a, there's a slight shape to this one. But um, I think one of the, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? One of the conversations hopefully we'll be having is we've got lots of real world laws. Um, and we currently just try and shoehorn them into the virtual world and hope that we can kind of find parallels. But of course, probably if we're starting from scratch, we might we might approach it a different way and start off with ignore what happens in the real world. That's another completely separate set of laws. But Michaela, as you say, when it starts crossing over, you need to make sure that they, they map okay. Yeah, and I think we shouldn't be limiting ourselves by, you know, looking at what exists and potentially works with some caveats in the real world and try to apply the same thing in the digital world, we can completely reshape this world. You know, it is also made by humans and it can be shaped by humans. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about better solutions than the ones we currently have and be more imaginative because we can. Um, just because we have certain legal system in the real world, doesn't necessarily mean we have to apply the same rules. It might be more straightforward and uh, potentially easier, um, but I'm not sure it's always the best solution, to be honest. Yeah. Lovely teaser. Before we get down that one, because it's exciting, let's just take a step back. And the, the place I keep meeting you guys, apart from Gaetano, obviously, every nice Italian occasionally, um, is uh, MTJG. Uh, those you can't you listening you can't see Gaetano's got the, the he's got he's got the bling on is it called the the um swag uh the t-shirt but we just had more than just a game 2023 it was about a month six weeks ago something like that yeah. um Gaetano do you want to because people have heard you before but do you want to remind people about that and what was going on there yes more than just a game is a, is a, is a series of events I mean we have a, a main event in in London every year in which in uh, uh two three days depending on the years we 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 invite a bunch of people to discuss uh, uh, the, the real question that we have about the evolution of intellectual property law, contract and regulation, and of course, I mean data protection still has uh, uh, is always uh, uh, always appear in, in our discussion because I mean this this form of uh, law and regulation tends to overlap. I mean they're, they're not living in a vacuum, so uh, we 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 want to address them together with uh, with experts in the field. It's a, it's a conference that uh, normally welcomes you know academics, practitioner, in house lawyer, uh, regulators to try to to find, uh, to explore potential solution to, to problem they were having. And we've been uh, uh, quite, quite good in the past in picking up topics that then became extremely relevant a couple of years uh, after. And uh, this year, the, the theme of the conference was, was the metaverse. 
And we, the, the timing was a little bit um, off because uh, when we decided to talk about the metaverse, it was just before the hype of the metaverse in which everyone started talking about the metaverse. And we, we had a particular take. I mean, what, what we were really interested in, what we uh, uh, discussed at the conference, for, for this year, for the first time, we're going to have proceedings. In a couple, in a couple of uh, uh, weeks, we will publish, you know, the proceeding of the conference, so we can share with the, all the people that were not there what have been what has been discussed and what are the takes, the takeaway uh, from the conference. We were really looking at, 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 at the implementation, the practicalities. What are the real beyond the hype and the discussion? What are the real issues that that IP will will get to to confront itself with? And uh, in, in the same time, there was the hype of the metaverse. And then uh, you start reading articles discussing the fact that the metaverse is not a thing. It's never going to exist. Uh, it's so far in the future that it's not really relevant. But I, 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 I disagree with this claim. I mean, uh, the, the, the path ahead of us is pretty clear. We like to use uh, virtual environment during the pandemic, but even post the pandemic, we realized that there could be a, a great advantage in, in, in connecting to three-dimensional persistent worlds. But of course, there are so many questions still to be formulated, just even before getting into the answer, how we want these things to look like. And that's the timing is really important because the fact that this technology is evolving and people started using it, we can look at video games because they are the most successful Proto metaverses. I mean, if you compare, you know, uh, the metaverse created by by some international institution with uh, millions of investment and thirty players to Roblox, Fortnite, Animal Farming, and uh, I'll stop the list there. The players, the people that use these environments, tends to be okay younger than us. That's a, an important point. So they have a capacity to interact with this virtual environment that we lack of. You know, I, I still I'm I'm stuck to pen and paper at some point. I mean, so, I, so I'm Gitano, Michaela. I'm feeling like a really old person here, um, <laughs> which is that's not unusual for me. I, I often find myself feeling that way these days. So I, I was trying to when you were speaking, then Gitano, I was trying to get some sort of sense of what the metaverse is. First of all, I thought it was one place. Um, then you said that they're kind of a, there are more than one metaverses. Is that the plural? Um, so I'm entirely confused. What is the metaverse? What is it? it it's, you know, help, help me understand it. Help a simpleton like me understand what the metaverse is. I don't think there is a, um, a unique or a singular uh, definition, as we found out through our, uh, through our research on the metaverse, where there was maybe over 50 different definitions of what the metaverse may be. It very much depends on what you want it to be. Uh, but there are a certain key uh, characteristics that all these definitions seem to have, uh, such as uh, centralization or decentralization of the metaverse, interoperability, convergence of physical and digital, just to name the few. Um, Matthew Ball has um, very usefully summed up um, these uh, these characteristics uh, in his, um, I think, most recent work on the metaverse. Um, I think one of the issues with uh, trying to find a suitable and, and working definition is that we are now in the kind of uh, cycle of the metaverse where I think everybody stopped caring about it. It's like, what, what metaverse? What are you talking about? Especially because of uh, metas and the performance in the field. I think a lot of individuals and organizations feel that the term has been completely tainted. And um, I think, as Gaetano said, it, it is going to develop and shape itself and we will be inhabiting it and using it. We might not label it the metaverse though. I think uh, there's going to be a certain issue with the with the terminology uh, itself. But imagine a digital environment uh, in which you can seamlessly move from one, um, let's call it an ecosystem to another. Say that you are playing um, a game like Fortnite, you're acquiring uh, different skins and assets, and then you take them with your avatar to uh, participate in a virtual concert. Uh, you can attend a virtual fashion show. You can go into your work meeting. 
uh, join an educational lecture with your kids about astronauts and the space, etc., while still holding on to your digital identity with everything that it entails from currency to assets to relationships and uh, contacts. Got it. Th thank you very much. And what I take from that most importantly is I'm not going to worry about what it's called anymore. So. <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> and it's, I mean, I think um, of our generation, it's, it's possible to listen to that and think, oh, well, that sounds like a bunch of dreamy stuff that's not happening. But of course, as we're identifying, there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time somewhere very similar to a metaverse already. We all know, get on, you'll have the numbers, but you know, the, the gaming industry is bigger than movies and music put together. So, you know, the, the platform's there, the interest is there. Um, it's been popularized in lots of culture at the moment. And uh, I mean, I think Ready Player One is that, I love that film and it absolutely sums up what it could be like. And I, I do love it. Um, so this isn't pie in the sky conversation. This is this is now, this is definitely happening. No, and, and it creates a lot of advantages because of course, I mean, uh, that, that's the difficulty with this terminology. I mean, it's a term that probably uh, Michaela is right, is tainted already. I mean, uh, probably also the rebranding on Facebook into Meta didn't really help for, for, for how people perceive uh, the Metaverse. There are a lot of concern about privacy. There are a lot of concern about business model, about even, even if we could have privacy, in, in, in a pure metaverse in which everything is interconnected and whenever you move around, everything has been tracked by, by, by commercial entities that, of course, are going to monetize whatever you do and whatever information you share on the metaverse. But on, on, on the reality track, we can see that there are millions of, 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 of in the younger generation that spend hours and hours and already building community and they're already building IP into environments that are very close to how we imagine the metaverse to evolve. And I guess the perfect example is Roblox. Roblox is a platform in which uh, generally kids, they just log in and uh, with basic coding, they create their own video games to be played with their friends. And then they create community online. And not only they spend money in order to obtain uh, items uh, within the video game, but they also, they create and they generate money by the popularity or their game, creating universes that are interconnected, of course, at the moment within Roblox, but can give you, I mean, if you want to show someone how the metaverse might look like, that, 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 that's a basic, uh, that's a very clear example. Of course, there are earlier examples. Second Life, for instance, probably was already a, 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 a metaverse according to which definition you want to, uh, to use. But the important thing is that there are virtual environment in which uh, an, a large, very large number of people coexist online at the same time. That is, uh, that is, I think, one of the things that is groundbreaking. Then how it's going to evolve because of monetization, because of what are the interests. Because, of course, we don't have to, to forget that sometimes, I mean, you can have a brilliant idea, but humans, they don't like it. <laughs> and they just don't use it. So there is going to be, there is not killer application or killer technology. It's going to be whoever is creating an environment in which we actually want to spend time because spending time in that environment would mean spend money and, and the commercial cycle uh, continues. Yeah, I just wonder whether we are okay with the, with the level of complexity of such environment often inhabited and, uh, and used by, you know, from very young people, children, kids, uh, to, uh, to users generally unaware of the complexity of IP and license agreements. I mean, is that comparable to real world? Do we go through, you know, life in the physical environment kind of oblivious to the laws of the land entirely? I don't know. I, I'm not sure whether there is a, a parallel and an analogy between these two environments. I sometimes find quite worrying that we have millions, billions of people inhabiting the space and completely not understanding how it is governed and what their interactions entail from the perspective of IP and contract law through license agreements. The fact that license agreements have become the single most important legal instrument governing your behavior online. And I'm I'm hoping I'm not making an you know it's not an overstatement that nobody reads it and very few people understand it. That thing you that that thing you click on the thing you click on yeah I know you mean the thing that you <laughs> click on yeah yeah. 
And the, do you think we've been, because I mean, the, the internet always seems to me beautifully and un, 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 really magnificently unregulated. So have we perhaps inherited that kind of sense of slight freedom that we got from 20, 30 years of the internet now? Where again, there's lots of stuff hiding it away, but maybe people feel, feel that they're freer than they are. And maybe that's why people aren't thinking too hard about it. I think the opposite is true that, you know, we are definitely not as free as we might be uh, in the real world from the perspective of law and regulation. Um, like if you think about privacy um, in the context of metaverse, there is no such concept. It, it's not going to exist. It's it's going to become completely obsolete. I mean, o o o already on the internet, it's uh, quite difficult to have the same level of privacy you would uh, like to have uh, offline. It's just... Uh... And probably there is going to be an evolution. There are less and less people caring about uh, privacy. At the end of the day, if you give consent, if you press OK, uh, most of the population is probably fine on the data they being monetized by, by third party companies. I guess as the lawyer, we're more concerned about privacy and privacy regulation. That the, 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 the general public, at least. I mean, I don't have data on that. I'm not just, uh, it is a guess. It's, is this one of the things that's odd about our world of IP is that we get to things before a lot of other people do, if it's to do with technology. Um, examples being a whole bunch of life sciences stuff, not for today, AI stuff, not for today, the metaverse for today. Um, in all of these cases, it's technology that's coming large, often coming through the patent system or the IP system more broadly that gets to the IP lawyers before other people start thinking about it because, you know, the technology leads to everything else, which always worries me, first of all, because <laughs> I'm not sure we're that well trained on some of the ethical issues that come up in some of these areas. But it, at the moment, obviously, we're focusing on IP law here in the metaverse. Are other areas of law getting involved in it or is it largely the IP world that's thinking about it now? No, it's a, a lot of lawyers and ethicists uh, are, are, are the first mover. I mean, I, we, we had a similar situation as in artificial intelligence. There were the, the computer scientists and the lawyer, the first one to write about artificial intelligence, even, even before chat uh, GPT was a thing. We were already <laughs> considering it because on one side, the scientists are creating it and the lawyers are the ones that have to deal with it. Uh, from from the origin, from whenever you're you know you're signing off agreement for the funding or acquisition of, of a company, they, they are the one that have to understand what the next uh, uh, few years future is going to entail for that particular areas. But in the metaverse, there's been also a, a a jump in the conversation really early, also from expertise that you wouldn't expect, like like geography or 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 or, or, or ethicist. Because there is a big concern that uh, uh, the trend is to actually to repeat what we what we have already. So try to replicate, you know, uh, regulation that we have uh, already successfully implemented on the internet into this new environment. And then someone started asking uh, whether or not that is a good idea. Because if you're thinking of an environment that's going to be popular and omnipresent like the internet is today in 10, 15 years, we should start asking the question. What are we creating and why? Is it is it a good thing to translate everything from the physical world in the online world? Because, for instance, one of the first things that Eddie has pointed out is like, do we really want and look forward to have digital poverty or 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 or, 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 or an environment? I mean, why? I do understand it that if I have the chair, you cannot have the chair. But in a pure virtual environment, why we should create a situation in which something that is probably accessible to everyone should be limited. And this called also sociologists saying, no, but this is, a, you know, property is really important for us. We cannot live in an environment in which everyone has everything. Calling for a lot of philosophical fundamental questions, and of course, I'm totally unqualified to, to answer, but they, they might impact the way we look at IP and the way we look at the evolution of IP. Because one of the things that is I'm 100% sure is is true and correct and actually i'm going on sabbatical for a year just to to read and write about it is with ip we can actually design the constitution of the metaverse because everything in the metaverse is on an ip license 
So we already know the AP is king. And I, okay, I'm, I'm totally biased. But in our environment, I guess we, there is a consensus that AP is really important, but it's going to be even more important. And when what Michaela was mentioning on education, I think that for the future generation, knowing uh, uh, about a copyright license and what an end user agreement is will be fundamental as knowing the basic rule of social coexistence in, in, in the real world. So, Michaela, <clears throat> apart from this podcast, uh, is anyone else talking about this problem that we're trying to apply old laws to a new system? I'm sure a lot of people are, and uh, especially with this kind of renewed focus on um, on the metaverse, at least like say four weeks ago, <laughs> where it sort of seemed to have completely uh, disappeared and been taken over by the AI uh, AI race uh, <laughs> that we're witnessing at the moment, which I think is a very, to be honest, very similar story. Um, but if I take example of, of virtual property, there was this, again, there was this hype around early 2000s where everybody, a lot of people were thinking about it, writing about it, and then it died, kind of died down because it wasn't interesting anymore. It was kind of concluded that it's not a concept that's viable, nobody cares, you know, it's not, it's not important for us to continue to enjoy digital environments, play video games. Um, new kind of uh, business models were being developed. Uh, 15 years later, virtual property, digital assets, especially in the context of, you know, what happens to all my stuff when I die, uh, is suddenly, again, at the forefront of, of uh, public discourse. Uh, scholars uh, are, you know, writing about it profusely, uh, thinking about our uh, ability to control um not just data, but assets in general in the digital environment through our life and uh, after uh, after our death. I think what is lacking, though, is a more scientific approach to, uh, to lawmaking. We make laws and write laws, at least I believe so. Many may disagree with me. Uh, based on assumptions, we don't have ways, scientific methods, to measure whether a piece of law or regulation has actually achieved the initial objective and whether it has achieved it uh, effectively and whether there have been any you know, negative uh, externalities, for instance. We just keep assuming that you know, certain regulation or certain piece of law actually works. Uh, take an example of license agreements. We are using them because we believe that they work. We don't have anything better and within two decades, uh, they are now an omnipresent legal instrument. But we don't have any evidence that it actually works. We don't know how good it is. We don't know how bad it is. We don't seem to care. We don't seem to measure. We don't seem to investigate. We don't seem to research this at all. There seems to be complete lack and absence of evidence-based approach to laws. And I think that's a big mistake. And I think that is one of the main reasons why we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. So what we what hasn't worked for the internet now seems to be kind of replicated in the metaverse. And um, we are yet to see what happens with AI. I love the idea of the measurability of the effectiveness of law. Because at the moment, you're right, it's a social construct. Um, that kind of works the lawmakers who are they who are who they are no one really understands who controls ethics anymore um and the, the only measurables we have is how well how well is society doing and i'm not convinced that the evidence is that positive as you say so it'd be fascinating to see the, the infinite measurability in the metaverse so that's a, that's an amazing concept um i think we've we got ip in the title so maybe we should just do a quick quick fire round now um on um some of the IP issues uh, that I've come across, at least, um, and I've heard about from MTJG and so on, um, and some quick comments and insights into some of the stuff. Lee, this is fascinating. I'm on the learning curve, some of this. Oh, yeah, no, no. I'm, d d please, please don't think that I'm not participating in this. I'm listening yeah. and learning, mate. So I'm going to chuck in a few buzzwords and see what we get. Um, and let's start with interoperability. How do we get all the different metaverses to work together? Where does IP sit there? 
I don't think we can. I mean, possibly technology we can, but uh, uh, even if we achieve interoperability on the platform, of course, there's going to be an issue on, on, on the rendering, on the amount of information that needs to be uh, transferred. So we will have a series of metaverses that are interoperable between each other, but the full dream of interoperability between all the online environment, the thing that at the moment is really difficult on a technical part. On the IP part, is, uh, is 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 very very tough to imagine how it could work. You will have to have licenses that are broad enough uh, between the IP owners. It's not because IP is not ready. It's the IP owner that might be the obstacle because there could be a very strong commercial interest not to have your brand in a particular man, not to have your brand going around in in metaverse in which you have no. Uh, contention with boss. Of course, if the metaverse is going to be decentralized. In case of centralized metaverses, uh, I think it's easier to imagine to have uh, a, a license to a single entity that maybe is uh, is is governing different uh, different uh, metaverses. But it's fascinating because interoperability was a word ten years ago that only relate probably to software <laughs> and Article Six. While now it became a more substantial way of looking. At at, at IP. And one of the questions in the back of my head is actually connected between copyright and trademarks. What do we mean with operability? Do we mean, you know, a Marvel character in a Disney world? <laughs> is that something that is connected to this concept of interoperability? And probably it, it will be because everything, at least the aspiration is to have everything interconnected and free flowing. There is something that we never had in the in the past, you you mentioned Ready Player One. Can you imagine the clearance process? <laughs> and, and, and that was Universal. <laughs> they, sorry, Warner Brothers. So they did have the main power to collect of that IP. Imagining you know IP being brought by the user in that metaverse. That's a, a little bit of an IP conundrum. I mean, I, I don't know how you can easily solve it. If you if you think about the fact that the the whole purpose of IP is to grant exclusive rights to right holders, interoperability is the opposite of that, right? It it kind of takes away that that exclusivity. So, I think we need to ask ourselves what would be the commercial motivation for rights holders to buy into full scale interoperability. And at the moment, there is no such thing. So, um, I think interoperability which will have to exist on multiple levels, sort of technical in terms of content, uh, licensing, NIP uh, may never be fully reached. We might have some aspects of interoperability that are easier to implement. And I think IP will, as Gatano said, will remain a, um, an obstacle and it will very much depend on the rights holders' motivation, uh, commercial motivation to uh, let go of that exclusivity to some extent. I think the reality is going to be that uh, you're going to be wearing a particular kind of brand in one of the metaverse, your avatar, and then you move to another metaverse and you appear naked because in that metaverse, the, the, the license doesn't cover that, that other environment. And of course, it's going to be detrimental to, to the experience, but uh, legally and on, and on the licensing point of view, I, I, it's really difficult to imagine how do how that could work? And we, we've all had that dream. Um, <laughs> the, and the, that that leads into the next bit, the quick fire round actually, which is another big topic, is kind of digital persistence. So the idea that you have a character in one regime, one one space, and you shift to another, and yeah, you still got your clothes on, you still got your artifacts, you still got whatever else people want to carry around with them. What what are the what are the issues there? What, what's the solution going to be? Well, I think that's that's what Gaetano mentioned in in terms of uh, the kind of very specific technical aspect of of that visual experience uh, you get when you are in one environment, trying to replicate that for another uh, for another ecosystem. Um, I am seeing a big push for for a standardization there. Otherwise, uh, I'm not quite sure how we'd be able to uh, to replicate one experience in a way that it's persistent. To to a different uh, to a different ecosystem. Um, so again, also not completely obvious and and automatic. And again, I think it may be difficult to quantify the amount of effort going into that because that's very much under the hood. Uh, it's 
you know, if if you're not working uh, on that particular aspect, it may be difficult to to um, identify if it's actually possible and how much effort is needed and whether it's worth it to you know uh, to that extent. Uh, I'm afraid this is another topic on which probably the the, the tech research is is probably years ahead uh, uh, than than the legal one because there's been a lot of discussion on standards in the metaverse to actually help not only imperability but also this uh, this persistency of the digital object in respective of where it's stored and where it started from. While while in IP we 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 don't have something uh, to to work with. Uh, the, uh, the analogy that would be a very new uh, environment, especially because even from the uh, graphic point of view, uh, different uh, metaverses they might have different themes and different graphics. So the moving on one digital object into a different environment uh, is still unclear. If it's going to maintain the original characteristic, the original uh, graphic, you know hyperrealism or cartoonish on whether or not we'll have to be modified in order to fit in the theme of the metaverse that you're walking into. And again, the question is whether or not IP owners welcome this possibility, whether or not they, they like the idea of their uh, uh, asset, the, 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 their graphical asset, to be converted into something totally different. They just look like, you know, is is similar to the original, but it's not is not the original. And whether or not people are okay with that, <laughs> to have that particular you know luxury bag being transformed into a block looking uh, you know uh, Minecraft looking uh, bag still maintaining uh, the IP value. Because to be honest, online most of the value of this item is based, of course, on, on the connection to the brand. I mean. The fact that the brand gives value to the asset is true in the physical world, but it's even more true. <laughs> the, the, the originality of the sources when it comes to a virtual environment. And I mean, you, you lead on to a point that we've touched on a couple of times, which is that in the end, how this works and whether it works is all about whether it has a commercial potential, which obviously it does. Um, but where, I mean, where does the monetization element come in? How are people going to be getting their reward for create. For example, what would drive interoperability? How might suddenly we see businesses saying, hey, no, let's make sure that people can walk between our worlds? I think I think the promise of the metaverse was um, initially shaped by the idea that this will be all about the user and the kind of economy the user will generate through interactions and, and microtransactions. Uh, so the promise of, of of the metaverse for the for the user is, you know, this will unleash uh, enormous potential uh, for you to um, transform physical objects into digital copies, create new entirely new digital objects, uh, and engage in interactions with, you know, an increased number of uh, of users and uh, and individuals and. Obviously, for the providers of these platforms, the commercial benefit is to building this ecosystem and environment and facilitating this new type of uh, user-based and creative-driven uh, driven economy. That's why um, another hype, NFTs, uh, were uh, you know hailed as as the one. Uh, technical solution that will uh, that will enable this and that will drive this this economy uh, forward. Um, but I think there's a lot of unaligned uh, or or misaligned interests, uh, and that's why a lot of these hypes have already uh, have already burst. I'm not sure whether users were interested in that particular model, whether they wanted to use NFTs in that way, which then turned out to be more of an investment instrument rather than anything else, rather than something that deals with, say, the lack of uh, virtual property and property rights and digital assets, and whether users do want to treat the metaverse predominantly as one giant marketplace. Um, again, I'm not sure whether this sort of version of digital capitalism is the most uh, inspiring um, philosophy for us. To underpin uh, this this growing new um, digital world, I think there are so many more other 
interesting uh, ways in which we could interact with each other than just to create stuff and then sell it. <laughs> now, from a business perspective, I think is the, the way it's been proposed. I mean, one of the definition of the metaverse could be is is a buzzword that comprises all the newest technology in order to maximize investment in, in your company because it's been uh, sold as you know as a new market. Place, uh, for instance, in, in, in the luxury fashion uh, uh, goods market, there was like, okay, it's a new marketplace, but it's also a way in which you can introduce your brand to the younger generation, not to risk that when they start, uh, you know, earning money, they don't even know that your brand exists because your your consumers tends to be tend to be older. But one of the things that is missing in this vision of the metaverse as a pure marketplace is that online environments and now. In the last 20 years, we do have evidence from video games. They only work if there are if there are places where people want to spend time on. Because if they spend time on, then they spend money. And then you can make millions of uh, pounds or dollars to selling uh, uh, skin, dance move, or, or, or you know, uh, limited edition uh, uh, upgrade pack. So you can monetize a lot on when the people enjoy staying in that environment. I don't think the opposite is true. It's, I don't think that people would like to spend hours and hours on on, on in a virtual world just because they can buy stuff. Uh, they, they at the end they don't really buy. <laughs> they, they get exclusive license for for a period of time or for forever. So I think that that is where a lot of the hype on the on the business side and on the market side of the metaverse is uh, is, is is slowly fading because at the moment. It's really almost impossible to calculate a return on the investment. It's just a, 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 a big gamble if you look at as a marketplace. If you take the other approach, the more conservative approach is something that is going to build on and it's going to be a place in which eventually there is going to be a sustainable marketplace. But but again, you shouldn't be starting from the business model. This is what we're doing. I mean, a lot of the business models are actually based on data or other business models are based on, on, on transaction. But in, in favor of the metaverse is also a place in which a lot of creators can actually ease in, a, in an easier way move into the market. They are they are amazing project like uh, Astra. Uh, I don't remember now at the moment that the, the developer and publisher they're dealing with it, but it's actually a, a, a metaverse for 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 designers in which they can just uh, uh, upload their design and then eventually it can be produced whenever someone buy the digital design in a specific, in, in the location in which has been acquired. And if you think of how, how successful this could be for, for young and independent designer, but also how environmentally friendly it is, because you don't just make clothes for the sake of making it, you only make the, the piece of clothing when someone actually buy it, independently where they are on the planet, that is that is fascinating. And I think that could be a good thing to look forward instead of just, uh, you know, thinking of Ready Player One, what was happening in the physical world wasn't particularly nice. Every time we speak about the metaverse, we tend to forget the fact that the metaverse in, in the cyberpunk, in the, in the sci-fi uh, sphere is an online world that everyone escaped to when everything on Earth is going... Uh, it's going very badly. Sorry. Badly. I, I, I said, yeah. I said, yeah. No, I can, I can see, I can see it. I can see it. I see the attraction of the metaverse from that as well. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting to to consider that there's going to be ways that humans extract value from it that we basically can't predict. I don't think anyone would have realized that the ultimate expression of the internet would be TikTok um, 30 <laughs> years ago. I, I still don't know what that is or what, what it does, and yet obviously it's winning. Um, so. Who knows what's going to come out of the metaverse? And I love this concept of digital capitalism. And I think we're going to have to look for the balance between digital capitalism and <clears throat> dot communism very much. <laughs> um, yeah, Lee looks least appropriately horrified. Sorry, Lee. I quite like that. Um, you've, been saving, th you've been saving that one up, haven't you? I wrote it down. I'm so excited. Um, so uh, last last kind of techie question. Um, just, just one more kind of quick fire round about some of the issues around it and it comes to Michaela's opener about people killing each other in the real world over online swords but in a more gentle way enforcement and policing of these rights where, where are the challenges there in relation to the metaverse other than actually murder which we don't really want to um so. I, I think the massive challenge is that we have pretty much outsourced a lot of these functions to private entities uh, who are the uh, gatekeepers of 
um, our behavior, enforcing rules, whatever they are. Uh, there is obviously some wider framework of laws and regulations in which these entities have to operate, but a lot of these functions, a lot of democratic processes have been uh, outsourced in this way. And I think it is a huge concern uh, from a sort of larger societal perspective, and we should worry about uh, how uh, interactions and, and behavior is, uh, is governed online, because the current system is hugely uh, is hugely problematic. There is uh, more or less oversight uh, on how these um, organizations, which, you know, let's face it, are uh, driven by profit. That That is their objective. They exist to generate profit uh, for their stakeholder, uh, for their shareholders. That is what they do. Um, again, I think in terms of AI, we are going to see uh, how this iteration is going to go with passing the AI Act uh, in the EU Parliament a week ago, I think. Um, is this a step in the right direction? Is it not? We shall see. No, but when it comes to IP enforcement, then uh, the, there is also uh, you know, the, the two different scenarios. In a decentralized uh, metaverse might be extremely complicated. We will go back to the early days in the internet in which uh, it's really difficult who to tell that an infringement is taking place in order for that infringement to be avoided or, or taken down. But on the other side, even in a centralized environment, there are, there are things that we, we should be aware of increasingly it might be easier to enforce ip simply uh, with a relationship with the gatekeeper and the, with the platform holder that in the in the long term can create problem to the ip system per se because uh, okay a doom scenario what is the point in registering my trademark in specific categories of goods and services in multiple jurisdiction, when it's probably cheaper and more effective just to register it with the platform, uh, this this private commercial entity, and then for whatever happens on that platform, they are gonna they are gonna enforce uh, my right. There is no need anymore to register, and this is not because I want to protect IP because it's self-serving, but IP in general tends to take care and protect everyone, not only the owners, but also the user and society uh, as a whole. I, I don't see it possible for you know, a commercial entities to actually maintain the same balance or rights that we do through, through legislation. So uh, we, we should look this space very carefully to see whether or not to, to maximize and simplify enforcement, we're not actually undermining the AP system per se. No, and I think that's um, a beautiful thing full circle, actually, to Michaela's point about it's time to start thinking about new laws, which I gather you're going to be writing on your um, sabbatical, Gaetano. So if you could just come back with a complete set of laws for the metaverse. Um, we'll, uh, Lee and I put a lot of influence through this podcast. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not promising anything. I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Lee, I'm going to hand back to you. Oh, thanks, mate. I'll get the last word. Always. Always. Come on. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm conscious we've got a massive amount of time and we need to draw the podcast to a close. But can I um, can I ask a non-IP question about the metaverse? It's been fascinating. I've been sat here listening to everything. Um, and this has been going round and round and round in my mind. So I'm going to have to ask it before I do my closer question, Willem, if that's OK. And that is, um, does the metaverse suffer the same kinds of things as the real world? So um, are, are you prone, because I've never really lived in it, so I don't know. Are you prone to like just stop oil protesters Barging, barging into a metaverse and gluing themselves to roadblocks or something like that—is that—is that something that happens? I'm not sure whether it happens. It's definitely possible. One thing I would say to that is that uh, we shouldn't believe that this new uh, dematerialized world is kind of exist uh, without connection to the real world. That it's completely, you know, disembodied from the realities of life. The very opposite is true, especially if you think about the amount of energy we will need to power the metaverse. Um, point, so I think we should think carefully, what are we building it for? So that it makes, you know, it's worth it. You, but you have, Michaela, now absolutely ruined my closer question. So, uh, so I, I, I always have to come up with a closer question that is only tangentially related to the podcast. I'm still going to have to use it because I've not got time to think of anything else, Gwilym. So, um, so, so we're going to have to assume that everything that Michaela just said isn't true. Um, 
and that, and that we are heading towards a metaverse that's entirely disconnected from real life and that's where we end up living our lives in a in a in an unreal world yeah so so forget everything michaela said let's put ourselves there um in this future Gwilym, where you're living in the metaverse and only in the metaverse what are you going to miss most about the real world oh um there's a scene in the matrix isn't there where he sits I've never seen it. all right there's a scene in the matrix where he's about to betray everybody and he's just having a steak and he's saying, I know it's not a real steak, but it tastes like a real steak. So I think it would be probably the the, the full experience of of, 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 a, of a good meal. That would, that would be my answer. Fair enough. Um, Michaela, what about you? If, you, if you're if you're permanently living in the metaverse, what do you miss most about the real world? Probably real sleep. I like sleep. <laughs> Great answer. Ooh. Ooh, I'm, got, I'm confused by that. Hang on. <laughs> Meta sleep. Meta sleep. Gitano, how about you, sir? Uh, I, I don't know. I think I think it might be something food related. Okay, think... so your your, your food is in your sleepies. Yeah. <laughs> and shall I go? Shall I go, Gwilym? Shall I round it off with me? I'd love to know, Lane. And it, it kind of brings us back full circle, right? To the side. smells. Um, I would really miss smells. I, I know I've not had smells for a couple of years because of the kind of ongoing sinus problems that I've got, but um. But my, I love smells, and I would really miss living in a world without smell. But but, but you could have them. I mean, now there's uh, okay. in VR okay. that could give you smell in VR. <laughs> no, that's, very, that's, that's very kind. So of you're me. safe. <laughs> yeah, and probably better than the smell of uh, wet London, uh, which I must agree with Gwilym does smell like not just wet dog, but wet fox. Ooh. Oh, 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 and, oh. I, and I think that's I think that's a place where we should end this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you both for sharing your time with us. It's been absolutely amazing. I, I again, this has been a school day for me. I've learned so much, um, but I'm also conscious that I've missed a fair bit because there's just so much to take in. So I'm really looking forward to listening to the podcast when it comes out because I'll um, I'll be able to um, pick up all the bits that I missed first time round. Um, yeah, thank you both. It's been amazing. Gwilym, thank you for being the perfect co-host again. And I'll see you on the next one, mate. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.